Hello and welcome to tonight's panel. You're uh, following the panel, Black Feminism and Culture in the Nordics. And today we'll be talking about what it's like to work uh, within the cultural sphere as Black women in the Nordics, who gets to be heard and under what conditions. My name is Justine Kelkai and I'm a researcher and activist uh, from Finland, currently based in Sweden, but coming for, to you today from Colombia. Uh, and I have with me uh, a quite impressive panel of women that you'll soon hear from more. We have Judith Quiros, who is a poet, poet, literary scholar, activist, journalist, writer, all the things uh, from Sweden. We have Phyllis Akinyi, who is also a researcher, performance artist, dancer, who is doing lots of incredible projects. She is from Denmark. We have Deise Faria Nunez, who is a performance artist and researcher uh, working in theater and other perform performing arts uh, based in Norway. And we have Monica Gatuo, who is an activist, uh, media researcher, uh, working on digital media and culture from Finland. Thank you all for, for being here with me today. I'm really excited to have such a dynamic uh, group of people together, and especially to be representing uh, different countries in the Nordics. We're only missing Iceland. So next time we'll have to make sure to get some, some uh, Icelandic folks in here as well. So to begin with, um, I, I, well, I wanna mention that this uh, event is uh, in part a result of the recent special issue of the magazine Asta, feminist magazine Asta, uh, based in Finland, published in Swedish, where we just made a special issue on black feminism in the Nordics that I had the privilege of being uh, guest editor for and where Monica, among several others, contributed. And that uh, special issue in itself, as well as this conversation, is a continuation of many conversations that have really sprung up since uh, the recent wave of Black Lives Matter protests around the world and in the Nordics since past summer. However, one of the things we've wanted to highlight with not only the special issue, but also with this panel today is that we've been here, we've been working on these issues, we've been active in different fields for a long, long time. Uh, the issue of anti-blackness and blackness in the Nordics is not new to 2020. And it's not the first time that people are speaking up or people are talking about these issues. It's just perhaps uh, one of the first times that we're getting the space, uh, the platforms to, to show you this. So I really wanted to bring together a panel of incredible people who have been doing this work for a very long time and who are a testament to the engagement of black women uh, and the Black feminist tradition in, in, in the Nordics. So with that said, I'm wondering if you all could share a little bit about who you are and how you came to do the work that you do today. Monica, do you wanna start? Um, sure. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Monica Gadu, I'm, I'm um, well, I've been working on a project um, with um, media activism for about four years now, and, and I've been talking about black feminism for a couple of years also. Uh, I think that the reason how I ended up in this kind of situation was that I actually can't remember what I really wanted to do when I was growing up, but I think that I, I kind of encountered a wall which I couldn't kind of go over or I can so I started like ripping it into parts so um to be able to rip it to parts I I had to like really get into what was going on with why I can't go past this wall so um and then I ended up here <laughs> thank you and uh can you say something more about you know the media sort of digital media as your, your interest in your sphere in particular. I know that you're also involved in lots of community cultural engagement in Helsinki as well. 
but what what drew you to this particular type of work um yeah i'm i've always i've always been drawn to media uh i think it's just about creating uh content that really i don't know <laughs> it's nice to share things and i i like visual things so i think that was the the route for me to just enter media in general but um yeah i've been i've been very interested um about the kind of issues of minoritized people in finland um the movement has always been there but it, i i don't think that it has been as strong uh as it is now uh and has been for about five six years um but um yeah we've been organizing a lot of discussions we've been organizing um uh, different kind of media outlets um both for women of color but also other uh, by poc um what else <laughs> uh doing research on people using uh people of color using media to kind of reach out to each other but also share and commentary public issues um yeah there's lots going on and i think that um these these lovely ladies here know even more about what the nordics have to offer because i think that finland is coming always behind uh sweden and norway and denmark uh with kind of knowing what to do and what kind of trends are uh happening um yeah but yeah <laughs> judith you um have of course participated in the cultural debates both as a poet and author but also as a kind of political commentator uh so perhaps you could comment some of some of what monica is hinting at but i'm also curious you know how did you come to do the the work that you do why did you choose this particular form of expression and art to do your work uh, it's a really long and winding road to be honest i am um studied uh, literature at university and I know I've always wanted to work with literature in some way uh, much to the disappointment of my parents um, <laughs> but then when I uh, I lived abroad for a while uh, in England and studied and when I came back to Sweden I um, didn't really know that many people I, I'd sort of lost track of where the conversation was culturally um, and was frankly really surprised to see the extent to which sort of uh, racist discourse had infiltrated every single sphere uh, of, of Swedish society, uh, particularly including the cultural and the uh, political sphere. So uh, a few friends uh, and myself started a website called Rumet, which was a separatist website for people of color in Sweden or people who are racialized as non-white. Um, because essentially what, what we had a sense of was uh, was the fact that we very rarely got to speak with each other about racism, about um, the effects of racism on housing, income, equality, or um, uh, health, uh, these kinds of things. Racism was often reduced to uh, sort of uh, talking about interpersonal grudges, right? Um, so, so we wanted to sort of uh, bring that conversation into into um, class politics as well. Um, and then uh, I sort of uh, just started freelancing, uh, writing about literature and eventually wrote uh, a book of poetry um, called O, which is uh, sort of about, um, it's borrowing from Shakespeare's Otello, but sort of reconstructing it in a Swedish um, setting, I suppose. Uh, and it's sort of discussing race and anti-blackness and its position in literature i guess and on stage um so that's why that's uh, sort of what it became <laughs> that book of poetry and at the moment i'm researching um black british poetry from the 1970s to the present um, and that's what i'm doing um and the, and the book O is definitely worth checking out. It is absolutely brilliant. You uh, have to say that though, because <laughs> you invited I me do, to the I do, but it's panel. also true. It's also true. <laughs> Desa, you have also worked with uh, performance uh, and theater, uh, but also building collectives. 
for people of color, women of color uh, in Norway. Can you tell us a bit more about you and your journey to doing what you do? So I um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, my, uh, my story starts actually in Brazil, uh, where I am from. I am not a native Norwegian. I uh, was born in Brazil and moved as an adult to Norway. And this, um, and, they, and the experiences that I had in Brazil, um, I, I understood that they were not all at all, or not all of them were um, applicable to the Norwegian context. And I just, I decided to become an artist when, after I moved to Norway. So I started an entire new life and I, um, um, I very, very soon I understood that the way I experienced otherness in Brazil was very different than the way uh, it is experienced in the Nordics. Mm. And this, um, I, I studied at the University of Oslo. I, uh, I had a, took a degree in theater studies. And when I finished, I was uh, very ready to go into the, the, the field and work. And um, unfortunately, I didn't find uh, a lot of positions. I uh, even applied for some, but I didn't um, achieve any of those positions. So um, I uh, very soon decided that I had to start uh, setting my own agenda. Uh, so this, uh, this led me to um, seek other women, uh, other black women, and try to understand our ex experiences from our different perspectives. So nowadays, I am a PhD research fellow at, uh, in theater at the University of Agder in Kristiansand, Norway. And my, uh, my research project is called uh, Estuaries, uh, the Colonial Feminist Afro Diaspora Perspectives on Performance, where I actually study the works of Black women or women from the African diaspora across the nordics yeah. and um, and this is um this is a very rich experience for me and like understanding the different the differences between uh, the nordic different nordic contexts so this is a, in very in short how i uh, yes ended up here thank you and last but not least phyllis yes hi um thank you for having me um and uh yeah i'm really grateful and it's lovely to be here also alongside one of the people i consider a mentor which is stacy um and uh yeah so i'm calling in from mexico city right now um i'm currently based in new york um where i'm developing a performance piece um yeah, but I am originally uh, born and raised in Copenhagen, a uh, Kenyan dad, Danish mother. Um, I started dancing 30 years ago, so I don't even, like this year is my anniversary. I don't remember a time before dancing. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of just developed, um, I, I left Denmark a long time ago uh, to pursue um, studies in flamenco dance in Spain, um, which then kind of just changed my world and my, my trajectory. Um, and I also have a degree in anthropology. And so I guess everything I do is kind of just a way of understanding myself and my position and people like me, uh, the position of, of othering and in-betweenness that we experience often in the Nordics um, and across the diaspora and, and um, trying to incorporate that in my art because that's the best way I can understand things is through creating and investigating artistically. Yeah. I love that. And so you've all kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could share a bit more about 
you know, how you see yourself using, applying, making use of black feminist thought or politics uh, in your in your work. I can say something. Um, yes, uh, for me, black the black feminist thought is um, uh, actually uh, the the ground stone of my entire work right now, and uh, not not only of my work but also my life. And I can um, I can really say that uh, it changed my life to understand the world through the lenses of black feminist thinkers, um, and. Um, I, I know that uh, most of you know, for example, Bell Hooks, who has been like my, you know, my, my, my star, a star that like I follow uh, for, for everything, like for uh, when I think about uh, representation, when I think about uh, love, when I think about uh, teaching, uh, everything, like Bell Hooks has a word for everything very prolific but also i have a big big influence uh, from um, afro-brazilian thinkers and um, this is also something that i want to be more uh, active into mediating in my work and bringing to the nordic context because a lot of people think that black feminism but also the struggle against racism or the struggle for social justice from a black perspective is something that was born in the us and i don't think so i think that it has been dialogues and uh, exchanges across the entire diaspora. We have a lot of influence from uh, the French Caribbean and um, also European black uh, feminist thinkers. So um, black feminism for me is uh, a way, a lifestyle. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you really hit the nail on the head there about something that I think is very important and specific to sort of our experience in the Nordics, right? Is there's this both this connection, right? Of course, to the US with the UK, um, with the work that's been done in the in the so-called West, the global North. But there's also this anchoring in the diaspora, where whether it's the continent uh, or um, in the the Afro Latin American, Afro Caribbean, right, experience. And I think that's quite special that we're able to draw from both the continent and the diaspora. Uh, as well as the sort of more uh, perhaps accessible or what better known kind of black feminist thought that comes out of the U.S. tradition. I'm curious how the how the rest of you negotiate with these things or use these things. Yeah, I have to say that I definitely definitely subscribe to Daisy's um, way of depicting uh, black feminism. I think that it's it's been a tool that has liberated me from um, from this kind of um, burden of of thinking that i i am a fault in in all cases where i'm trying to do something and i i can't do it because of all all the uh limits that are built uh to just kind of yeah kind of limit me uh and i think that um with black feminism i've been able to um comfort myself to um to kind of this uh, how would i describe it like a like a better self esteem of things that this is this is this is a thing that is um racism and the effects of racism and white supremacy are things that are affecting my life but also other other uh bipoc uh people's lives and and that we are not when we're looking at arts and we're looking at media content or whatever we're doing, we're looking at stories that are told. And those stories are not, I don't think that they are let out the way uh, they should be, done, should be let out. And I think black feminism has definitely had an impact on that, that we, um, we have now and we've had um, before, but I think that this wave now that has hit us has given us more leverage and more ways of of depicting ourselves and, and creating from within ourselves without feeling that shame or feeling that burden 
um, that the society is trying to kind of um, have on us. So yeah, <laughs> but I think that, um, I don't know, like if I have to, if I have to say that one thing that black feminism has affected in my life is definitely my self-esteem and my belief in myself. Yeah, to add on that, I think there's something about um, realizing that you're not uh, crazy, um, right? In a way, because I think especially in the Nordics, um, because we're not necessarily seen or heard um, and our um, experiences are often questioned as being true or not. And so um, I think there's something about understanding, reading up on theory, um, reading up on these big thinkers um, from decades ago up until now and seeing that this is structural, this is systemic, this is not per se me that's uh, at fault, but it is the way the society is structured. Um, so I completely agree with you on that, Monica. Um, and I think as for me personally, um, I cannot separate myself from black feminism. I am black feminism. <laughs> um, and, and so that kind of just um, exudes through everything I do. And um, even when I studied anthropology, um, both in, at Copenhagen University and at Complutense um, in Madrid, I made sure that I focused on these topics because they're important and yet um, I was often questioned or even ridiculed for wanting to write my dissertation on black hair in corporate America um, or uh, write a paper on um, blues lyrics from the 20s as a way of understanding how black feminism was way ahead of white feminism in, in the US in the topics that you know were addressed by women. Um, and, and so I think that it's just, and again, also in my, in my creative work, um, as I said, I'm developing a new piece. It's about grief and it's about uh, collective grief. It's about um, ancestral grief, um, intergenerational grief, um, and just personal structures of being othered my entire life and, and the pain that, that resides in my body from that, um, that I'm trying to kind of get out in a way. Um, and so I think that whether we, we want to or not, um, because we are constantly othered, exotified, uh, racialized, um, questioned in, in the sphere that we are working in, meaning like geographically the Nordics, I think it's, very, it's a very important tool for us to be aware of the power of black feminism because I think that often um, in the Nordics, we, we, we pride ourselves in being at the front, like front runners on, you know, um, feminism, inclusion, um, liberation, but that is quite often only so for the white majority. Um, and so I think that growing up in a place like that, which several of us have, it's, it's really important to find the power in in us, because we are very powerful and we are we are survivors of a very horrible structure, and so it's it's really yeah. Now I'm just babbling, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I resonate with what both of you are saying. Um, yeah, I I just wanted to add on to to the rest of you. It's really interesting to hear kind of your thoughts about um, what black feminism has meant to you. I think for me, it's, it's um, really been meaningful in the sense that it's, it's taught me where to direct my energy uh, and it's taught me how to build communities, right? Like transnationally, uh, diasporic communities, um, how to, where to direct solidarity and in what way. Um, because because again, having grown up in in Sweden, uh, I found myself 
as a kid, very frequently surrounded by the idea that racism was a massive misunderstanding, right? It was about um, people didn't, people were afraid, uh, afraid of you because they didn't know, uh, they didn't know immigrants or they didn't know any enough black people. And all you really had to do was talk to them um, talk to white people, uh, get them used to you. Um, and then they would embrace you. And, and all the major anti-racist campaigns were also like that. They were about uh, increasing understanding of the other, right? Uh, completely divesting racism of any sense of power, any connection to the material world, <laughs> any connection to uh, economics, uh, globalization or colonization. And so um, it, it, what it teaches you, this that kind of anti-racism is that it's it's on you as an individual, uh, right, to to teach others not to be racist. And for me, black feminism and the black radical tradition taught me that that's a trick. <laughs> it it's a way of getting you to direct your energy at the white majority rather than the black community, rather than working class communities, rather than building solidarity there, rather than building theory, action. Um, literature, all those things, uh, rather than uh, putting our, our love and energy into each other, we're taught to direct it to something or someone who who just wants to disperse it, right? Um, and so it's it's taught me that, and and it's been incredibly important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of identifying uh, structures of power and and their weaknesses and strengths, and also kind of highlighting where how and where solidarity is possible um, and I, I would say it really permeates uh, most of the politics I do and, and most of the writing that I do as well um, particularly because uh, I think for me literature is also a way of building community of, of um, quoting uh, of uh, you know um, allying yourself with certain like textual literary or genre traditions and, and so it, the politics of black feminism has definitely permeated my writing as well um, yeah and and also I just wanted to say what Daisy said as well the, the really interesting thing about we can gather here and talk about the specifics of being black women in the Nordic but we can also communicate transnationally about what blackness is and how it's shaped our lives. And that would be understood there too. Well, this, this, the specifics are different. There's also that transnational element to it. Like you don't stop being a black person. Uh, yeah, so I, I find that interesting too. And I'd like to add to that. I love how like all of you have also brought the kind of joy that black feminism has brought like the, the understanding and the celebration of, of blackness and, and all the forms of blackness and how, um, how we can, as women, black women, also create things that change a lot of, like change the world and change the way we and other people see this, this life that we're living. I was just going to say that I, I love that, that absolutely I agree that it's it's about so much more than just sort of finding tools for critique, right, and understanding the, the world we live in and understanding white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism and homophobia and all the things that sort of structure our worlds, but that it's really also about the creating of community, new kinds of community, new kinds of theory, new kinds of practices, right, imagining new worlds um, together. And and I think that there's something really special in in sort of cultural work, right, and, and producing art and culture that lets, lets it become this communal experience. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you think, you know, to take it to the Nordics for a moment or to your local national context. <sighs> How do you see sort of the possibilities, the experiences of, of doing this, 
doing black feminist work and doing this work as black women um, in the particular field that you're in? You know, what, what's, what's your sort of pulse check on that today? Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. Sometimes it feels a little bit like you have this enormous uh, block of ice on the floor and then you are trying to dry it with a cloth. Um, because it always feels that is uh, so little that we are doing. It feels very little because, um, in a sense, um, it reverberates to um, to other black to other black people. Uh, for example, my work it does, and I see it does. But at the same time, I um, I feel that we still lack more solid organizations and even though there are organizations uh, for example in oslo uh, we have the mira center uh, which is an uh, actually an intersectional uh, organization as um, it is um, for and by uh, women of different nationalities and races uh, but like the migrant women is in the center there and, and they have been working for many, many years and achieving a lot. At the same time, I see, for example, an enormous invisibility of specific groups like trans black women, for example. So um, it's still, um, I sometimes I, I feel that it's very good to see that since I moved to Norway like 22 years ago, things have, cha have changed a little. But still, the structures are pretty much male and white and normative. And uh, we have still got, got a way to go in terms of discourse, in terms of not having to uh, start always from the same point, like which is explaining why certain things aren't OK <laughs> um, and, and why certain things have to change. Yeah, I definitely, in, in the case of Finland, I, I can agree on that a lot. And I think that um, even though the, the topic is now very trendy and we're, we're in, a, um, in a wave of, of having that space at times in, in mainstream media or mainstream discussions, there's still a really long way to go to be actually mainstream to be actually um, part of well, whatever identity finishness is so um yeah <laughs> um yeah literature <laughs> i suppose there are two sort of uh, there are two major ways I interact with literature, I suppose, as a published poet, but also as a literary critic. Uh, and I'd say, um, yeah, I'd say it's really difficult, depending on sort of uh, which area you're in. Um, literary criticism, of course, is overwhelmingly white. Um, but, but that's, I don't think, I mean, I think the issue rather is that, that we've reached a point where um, black radical politics have sort of made their way into the cultural debate, right? So people kind of know vaguely what's going on, and it, largely due to Black Lives Matter. They really didn't care about black organizing before then, really, but even if it was in Sweden. Um, so, so they kind of know that, um, but, but they engage critically with sort of the commodification of black, uh, feminism or, or black radical politics. So they'll be like, how can you say that Beyonce is uh, a, a black icon? How can you say that um, uh, this uh, black company is important uh, due to the, in the liberation of, of black people? And it's like, that's not where the co 
conversation is. <laughs> that is not where we are as black women or black thinkers or, or politically active black people. Nobody is, is saying that. Um, so you get this kind of like cheapening of, of uh, black criticism where, where nobody really knows what, what they're engaging with, but they know that they can kind of get points of a, um, dismissing it because it makes them look intellectual, right? It's, it's like this whole backlash against what is uh, ironically referred to as wokeness. Um, mm. Nobody really cares about uh, sort of engaging really with the, the serious aspects of the, of the criticism, rather they've found like a tweet or something by a, a teenager and they go, look at this, this is hideous. Or like now mm. recently with the, the debate around who gets to translate Amanda Gorman, for instance. Yeah. Um, mm. The debate has been sort of, you know, people clutching their faces and pearls and being like, are you saying white people can't translate black poetry? Like, that's clearly not what the debate is, right? Like, that would be ridiculous <laughs> if that was what it was about. Rather, it's a way of kind of bringing to light sort of who gets to be the voice, right? In, yeah. in which languages and, in, and why is that? Like, how come? Uh, as a person who has done some translation work, uh, myself particularly with black text there is a lack of of understanding of certain terms right like <laughs> it's just about a lack of of um knowledge um and, and i don't think you would um i don't think that you would be that casual with things with other things right if people are blind to the cultural context for instance and um for instance the term weave right um, I have seen some really crazy translations of weave. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think and then, yeah, I think and and Finnish context like there's, um, we we tend to well not we but you know the translations are an issue. So there's a yeah. lot of old words that are used because there are no new words. And and even though the the people of color in Finland um, have there's there's at least four five organizations that have been talking about um, language and have been talking about words and and at least two of them have created um, like dictionaries online for uh, different kind of instances or institutions to use, they still decide not to use those dictionaries or not to use those words because they prefer to whatever words were before, you know, that were already um, back when they were used, they were not okay to use, but they, they decide that, you know, there's no other words, we have to use these old words before we can come up with new ones. And I think that <laughs> maybe with the weave, it's also like, we don't know what it what this is, but you really know what it is. And, and there, there are other words for it, but you just choose not to, not to use the word. Exactly. Yeah, but, but that's what the debate is about, isn't it? It's about like, uh, as, as black people in Sweden, for instance, there is a vocabulary there that's in development, like in the community. Um, but it's very rarely uh, lifted into literary language because mm. we're not the ones who translate this sort of stuff. We're the ones yeah. who are consulted after it's already been translated. So. Uh, we don't actually have an effect on the literary language to that extent. Um, and that would be, I think, maybe the underlying, <laughs> the underlying discussion when it comes to, for example, translations of Amanda Gorman, right? Like, that's mm. what it is. Mm. Um, but when it comes to, say, poetry, for instance, I have to say, like, uh, the published poetry is not where, that's not where Black poetry is happening, like, in terms of building community very it's it's rare right that a, a black person gets published um and then they're usually uh likened to other people of color like quite randomly for instance i know when i published my book uh, i i got one negative review which is completely fine but the review concluded with like <laughs> but here are some other books by non-white writers that I like better. <laughs> Just like <laughs> so crazy. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> it's like that's the genre. 
<laughs> that was really funny. Like, imagine like concluding a review of like Virginia Woolf or something with like, I did not like this book, but try a book by another woman. <laughs> so funny but yeah so so I'd say like we it's not great there like I wouldn't say like it's like in the the smaller kind of uh, slam poetry scenes the competitive scenes like there are there are like um uh scenes such as I think it's concluded now but revolution poetry which was very active during a five-year period lots of people engaged with that it became incredibly popular it toured around Sweden and it was mainly young people of color right from uh, the southern Sarutan. and then uh, uh, was another was another thing um, but the moment but the moment you put that into kind of that's not the kind of poetry that gets published uh, we were talking about who gets heard and why and how black feminism is very good at identifying hierarchy and power and I'd say like when it comes to the the poetry scene in Swedish like it's, it's deeply hierarchical some things are considered poetry some things are considered not poetry and it's it's uh, deeply racist there's a bias in class as well obviously um mm. so so you can't really but but I think that's what's been so important for me when it comes to kind of engaging with black thought and and talking to other black people it's like maybe our energy well maybe my energy the energy of black writers shouldn't be uh, directed at these big publishing companies that kind of breaking through uh, in those arenas because um maybe the important thing is developing our language and um, developing our poetry being in communication with the kind of poets that we like <laughs> right with the kind of politics that we we like yeah, there's so many things there that you really mentioned that I think is so important. I think one of the things about, you know, language and who gets to translate, I think one of the things about sort of the conversation about representation is that I feel like we're still stuck in the conversation around representation for representation's sake, mm -hmm. not understanding that it's like, yes, representation matters, of course, for the way that it impacts people who see it, people who can see themselves and things. But it's also about, you know, not just who's on screen, right? Or like who's in who's in the room or what, what something looks like, but it's about how it gets shaped by that, right? Different perspectives make a difference, right? This is why when we talk about, you know, black films, for example, the difference it makes when it's a black director, a black writer, because they'll just gonna write the experiences in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. When you're translating poetry or literature and you don't know what a weave is like that really if you don't know what a weave is there's so many other things that you don't understand about anti-blackness and about uh you know whatever we're talking about so right this kind of i feel like we're really behind in the conversation there where we're not at the point of actually understanding that it makes a difference because it's going to impact what you're making of it um, and i find this to be really the case in sort of research more broadly as well, where this has not really been understood. Um, but it's not just this superficial, you know, question of, you know, there needing to be more black and brown faces in high places, but that it's mm. really about how things get shaped by it. Um, mm. And I also think that the point um, you made, Judith, about, you know, the where we sort of direct energies and what gets seen as legitimate, right? I mean, that's obviously a question of, I'm curious what you'll think about this, obviously a question about the script. I mean, the art scene, right, is of course operating within the broader political economic structure. Um, so who gets access to particular modes of production? Who gets platforms, right? Who gets uh, treated as legitimate certainly matters. But I, like more broadly, but I also think that there's a particular thing about sort of black cultural production uh, in what you said, Judith, about, you know, what kind of poetry gets seen as poetry. Um, and I found this even in my, my own work, I've been working on sort of looking at sort of underground, black underground rappers and the way that they can sort of access particular vocabularies, political vocabularies mm -hmm. and great uh, discourses and spaces precisely because they're outside the mainstream and because it's hip hop and what that means for them. And I remember when I was publishing my first article on the topic, one of the reviewers was clearly like a Finnish music scholar, 
said, you know, these guys are not proper rappers. They're, you know, they're like teens using YouTube. Uh, like they were not even considered musicians because they weren't signed to like a mainstream label or whatever other criteria mm. you use, right? Mm. But I'm like, they're they're producing music. They're, I mean, what else is required for them to be musicians, right? Um, so just even that kind of who is even really a writer, who's even really a poet, who's even really a rapper, who's really a a, a dancer, whatever, I, I think also really um, says something about, you know, the way people frame black people and black cultural forms in particular. And I think that it's also about like um, the space that there is, there's usually space for one or two. Uh, and then, then we tend yes. to, uh, we tend to go with the game so to say, yes, so we yes. start fighting about this one place or this two places that are, which are also uh, defined by, by the white mainstream, like who are the eligible for those who are palatable, who are not too political, who are not saying too much, um, mm. who are you know providing us with enough black culture, but not too much, um, and, and who, are, who are writing about it or who are, uh, depicting it in a way that is understandable for the white majority. Yes, I think we have like a kind of um, uh, fight, I think, and it's like even in our own uh, minds, there is a fight between representation, occupying uh, white spaces and creating our own. And that's this kind of like, I think, of course, like you are uh, also saying that representation is important, but I think at one point representation is actually holding us back. Yeah. The fight for representation is becoming an end instead of a means. And this is uh, like so important to see because how you can actually uh, create radical change if you don't change the center of things and uh, create several centers. So, um, yeah, and I, I think, think there's also, sorry, yeah, yes, no, but yes. speaking to that, I think there's also something about like the burnout that comes from entering these spaces and taking up these discussions and always being depicted as the angry black woman and like never being heard for calling out the blind spots in the institutions and the systems. And, and yet again, and so I'm, I'm completely with you on the, the questions on should we continue to fight for representation in which that fight actually also is kind of erasing us because we burn out? Um, or should we just focus on creating our own centers um, and then the rest must may follow? Um, but in that, I think there's a really important thing, um, at least something I've encountered um, being in and out of Scandinavia as an artist is especially at least I can say for the dance field, how uh, much value and importance funding has to your ability to create and be visible and you know, grow as an artist, um, but who gets the funding? Exactly. And so that, that is uh, a major thing in, in, in my world because I see how um, in dance, what is what is considered art and what is considered um, social impact or what is considered some sort of uh, exotic culture, that there is a hierarchy. And um, in that hierarchy also um, lies who gets to enter the state-funded schools. But what do they teach at those schools? Who are teaching? Which styles are we talking about? And so in that, who also gets then subsidized funding in a way? Because it's like either you go through that way, which seems to be predominantly uh, white with a predominantly white Western take on contemporary dance. And so that is the, that is the area that we have officially considered to be the artistic part of dance mm -hmm. in the Danish scene. And thereby, it also becomes easier to get funding, to get access to uh, producers, spaces, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, leaving a lot of other genres out and often with that also a lot of racialized people out. And so you have this fight of how do we not take it personally in a way, right? Because if you, if you keep getting rejections from funding with uh, let's say the sentence of due to the level of artistic quality, mm. Yes. Right. Again, that is a pet peeve of mine. What is quality and who gets to define that? How can you sit and define whether or not my work or someone like me's work is of quality when you don't understand the basics to the foundation in which I move? Similar to the weave, if you don't understand other styles of dance, how are you then to say from a point up here, how are you then to look down and say, well, this is art. This should be a social project. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, folklore for, uh, I don't know, a fun day in summer when we showcase the world, right? As, as something to look at. And, and it's just, we need to change the narrative on that. And that's why I, although I, as an artist, I've had to separate myself. I've had to create my, my own center because or else I can't, I can't mentally and physically survive. It is too draining. Mm -hmm. But as a community worker, we need to ask, and so therefore I need to ask the questions on who sits on the boards, who sits on the boards and the institutions and the state funding and the theaters, who gets to decide who we see who gets to decide what is art? Who gets to decide which artists will be funded enough to continue? Because it is a constant struggle for every artist, but if you don't get any funding, if you don't mm -hmm. get any visibility, if, if there are no gatekeepers that understand the, the structure in which we operate, how are we then gonna change anything for the next generation? And the thing is, just to, you know, but it's not a handout. We are not someone who should just like, be given something by the people. We are art, we are intelligent, we are fabulous and we know what we're doing. And we are also the future of Scandinavian Nordic art, right? Yes. So we need to, and, and and on top of that, something I talk a lot about outside of the Nordics is the fact that when we talk about state funding, it's tax money, right? So yes. this is not- It's also like, ours. It's also ours. We need equity in this. This is not a question on handouts. This, this is a question on like, where is the tax money that we're paying, our parents are paying, our grandparents are paying, where does that go? To whom? Does that go? Mm. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, I think that was like a very, you know, a very good summary of like what's happening in general. Like where, who has the money? Who has the power to decide who are getting the money? And then also I think within our community, like, are we really taking our community with us when we are going to places? Like, is it is it all, all, always so that you know we see new faces, or is it you and your friends? Um, so we have to like think about all these steps to actually change those structures. But also like combining, well, looking back at what, what uh, David said as well, the the combination of scarcity and competition, like we've all that's what we've all been talking about in a sense of. The fact that there's uh, cuts being done to the arts all the time, right? And then they have to define art more, they, <laughs> the, the funding bodies define art more and more narrowly. And, and how, do we, how do we maintain solidarity uh, in that kind of cultural moment, right? Where, where we're fighting for funding um, we're told, oh, we already have a black girl, right? Like it's <laughs> it's just uh, it's 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 a way I think as well of, of ensuring that these forms of solidarity that we we try to practice break apart because they're not consistent with 
late capitalism, well, capitalism at all, of course, but particularly now, I find um, those forms of solidarity are not supposed to be practiced. Uh, if we don't engage in competition with each other, if we don't accept that, then uh, we, in a sense, are not accepting the order, right? Um, and I think that's what black feminism engages with frequently. What you said, Ismin, about about imagining a new world and also behaving yes. as if it's possible. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking exactly about this word, imagining, and daring to imagine it together, because uh, this I think this is one of the most radical things that we actually can do. It's start to envision what we really want and and define it, take the, the, the power of definition in our hands. And in this sense, I would like to mention one of the artists that I have been in dialogue with. It's um, Sonia Lindfors from Finland. And she has this very much um, idea of gathering black artists to imagine how we want to change the world. And I remember that first time she asked me to do that, like how, and she was asking me a very concrete question as to how would your body feel if it was completely free from all oppression and it was like one of the most difficult exercises that i have ever been proposed so um i think this is one of the keys that and i really appreciate also that judith uh, uses the word radical without fear of being misunderstood because also our words are being constantly hijacked and uh, and uh, yes i think we should dare more Absolutely. And I think, I think speaking of that, I think that's an important thing to, to actually engage with. Uh, not only sort of the, yeah, absolutely the hijacking and distorting, right, of, of black politics, black thought, black culture, black people, um, but the twisting of it for the sake of, as Judith, you were sort of mentioning, it's kind of building up this, this straw man fallacy, right? It's the building up an, an enemy that you can then so easily look, knock down type thing, right? So you can sort of get points for engaging with something, but you're not really engaging with it. And then there's another thing that I think is really uh, important for the, for the cultural sphere, spheres in particular, which is consumption, right? That there's plenty of people and institutions who are more than happy to consume blackness, to consume black culture, to consume black uh, products, black pr production, um, but on, under under specific conditions, on specific terms, right? In a way that, again, also doesn't fully engage, right? It's this kind of distortion uh, that's necessary there. I'm, I'm curious if you can speak to that sort of, I mean, I think, I think it also, connects with this conversation about representation, right? Where it's sort of like, if, if representation is supposed to be the end goal, then you're supposed to just be happy that there's interest, right? Or that there is this, this desire to consume something, but that does not actually mean respect or engagement. And in fact, it's often another vehicle for, for oppression. Um, I'm cur curious if, if you've had experiences with your thoughts about, about this within your I think there's something about um, 2020 and the, the understanding or the interest in, in, um, in the Black Lives Matter protest that happened across Scandinavia as well, um, to an extent that we hadn't seen before, even though I know that all of us here have been engaging in this uh, for years. Um, and I, I, one of the things that I noticed amongst um, my peers in Denmark of um, black and racialized artists was th um, this feeling of, we gotta seize the moment now because yeah. it's only now that we get spots. Like it's only now that, that they're seeing us. But in that, that momentum, um, to me at least, it, it, it seemed very hollow because I don't trust that they actually see us. I don't trust that they are actually interested in sustainable change. And so in a way, this uh, momentum 
anxiety that is created within a lot of artists, of uh, black artists um, in these times of, let's say, institutional wokeness, um, that that is actually just an another, another level of, of eradicating us and like burnout because we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's so much grief, there's so much loss, there's so much everything. And yet it's like, but it's now we got to produce because it's the only time in Scandinavia that we ever get to get on all the platforms and maybe get some funding and et cetera, et cetera. But that's not sustainable. Um, so we really need to talk about like the people who sh all of a sudden show interest, the gatekeepers who show interest, do they understand what we're actually saying and doing? Or are they putting us into a box that fits their understanding of blackness and what is needed to be able to tick a box? Um, because blackness is not, is, 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 is not hom homogenous. We are not a one unity. We are a, a bunch of individual beautiful people who happen to share black experiences of being in the Nordics, being a black body in the Nordics, but we are also very, very different and work with very different aspects of blackness and art and literature and, you know, um, academia. And we deserve to be seen as individuals. We deserve to have the same privilege as the, the Scandinavian majority of being seen as and heard as individuals. I definitely agree with Phyllis also about hijacking, but also like just consuming it. So creating just like commercialized products out of Black, Black Lives Matter, but also out of uh, people of color in general in, in the countries. Like here is here is our DNI, uh, you know, specialist who is the only POC in our institution. Here is this and here is that, um, and kind of forgetting that the, the whole institution needs to change for that one POC to be able to uh, be there and the, the relationship with that institution becoming sustainable, it needs to change completely. Um, I think that and also when we're talking about blackness is like, as said before, it's, it's, it's not a certain one, uh, one monified uh, depiction of a, a culture or an heritage that we have, but it's it's it, it comes with the different diasporas. It comes with the mix of of the Nordics. It comes with all these kind of um, layers and and intersections of things. And I think that um, while Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matters did bring us this kind of um, recognition of of Black pain, it still also is a trend and what happens when the trend dissolves like we're still going to be black and brown after that mm -hmm. like how are we how are we gonna how are we gonna maintain uh, a discussion and 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 further take further the development and i think that i think that that's one of the key questions i think in finland at least that um it has it, it didn't pass in that way because black lives matter was it was uh, it was a topic in 2016 already. So how do we how, how do we incorporate that? That there is a history with that, but there's also a history with us. Mm. Um, I think that, for example, in your work, Jasmine, when you're discussing the kind of American the Americanized um, violence that comes with also like the Americanized thought of 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 the racialized people. So how to like bring it together with with the understanding of the the Nordics and how how to go further with that? How to like Days is saying like imagine where are we what is what is it that we as black women or as POCs what do we imagine this going towards to? One thing that you also oh sorry oh. <laughs> everyone got rid oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead, David. I, I just thought about also this um, um, idea of resisting this commo uh, commodification, commoditification, because um, I, um, I uh, now work with um, 
um, multi multimedia um, um, expressions also to mediate my uh, my research and one of this uh, one of those is um, an installation or video installation called colonial products and it's it's uh, I take a lot of fruit I started working with fruit right and um, and I can also work with coffee or with uh, uh, herbs or, or different different commodities that are um, and I, I see blackness as one uh, of those kinds of commodities and how we can resist that by just really embracing the fact that uh, black culture is the culture. And this is something that uh, on Brazilian feminist that I really admire, Sueli Canero has also asked me and she was asking like with a very um, smile in her face asking me like uh, what do you mean when you say black culture because uh, and if you think about the US and oh, about Brazil like I mean black indigenous culture is the culture and then you just change change it uh, like move it to other hands and and hijack the names and and the black and the black subject disappears from it so um, this uh, this like radical individualization and is still being community. It's a lot to think about. One of the things I wanted to ask you all about, you kind of mentioned a bit, and I'm also thinking we've all had experiences of living, living outside the Nordics, living outside of Scandinavia um, for periods of time, you know, what do you think is particular? about the things we're talking about? What, what things are particular to the Nordics, right? I imagine there are things about this, as again mentioned, that are just part of the global black experience. Um, and there are things that are just part of being an artist, being in, in the cultural sphere. But what's particular about doing this work as black women, about doing black feminist work in the Nordics? In your I think to me, a lot of it has to do with engaging with the kind of self-image um, of, of, particularly in Sweden, as being a progressive, non-racist country, that racism is um, hate crime. Racism is usually what happens in the US, right? It's not what happens here. And if it happens here, it's usually like a Nazi who is universally condemned and then rehabilitated in a moving documentary starring usually a celebrity chef or something. <laughs> so, I mean, that's difficult. It's difficult to say, well, these are examples of racism, right? Um, because everyone knows that racism is bad. Uh, and so what they do cannot be racism. And I think that's got to do a lot with this kind of um, emphasis on intention that people think that you have to intend to be racist you have to be consciously racist and you have to be mean or evil <laughs> to be racist and so because that doesn't fit with their self-image and I and I do mean nationally and uh, then then there's no such thing as racism right I think the experience of being a black person in Sweden is an experience of being continuously gaslit on every level um, you're subjected to racism you you talk about it you're told that no that's not what racism is um the discourse changes right so for now for instance like we have like a genuine conversation about re-migration so immigrants coming to sweden and then being sent back um and that's like a real <laughs> a real political suggestion and we're supposed to not link that with racism we're supposed to say oh when you point out that that is racist then it's like oh no it isn't it's not racist because it's not based on the idea of race. Uh, and in Sweden in particular, they've even removed the word race, right? From, from it's not a discriminatory basis because it doesn't exist. So people act as if it exists, but the moment we acknowledge it, we become the racist. Um, and so I, I think it's Sarah Ahmed who talks about that, about how you, when, you, when you bring up the problem, you become the problem. And so you, the so you have to be silenced or in some way uh, pushed out like the, the way that you discuss the problem has to be changed fundamentally um 
And so I think that's a truly frustrating <laughs> experience is, is, is um, nothing, nothing is truly racism. And, and we saw that during Black Lives Matter as well. For instance, oh, yes. uh, the leader of the Christian Democrats, Ebba Bush, she wrote an article. Um, uh, it was overwhelmingly, in the beginning, it was overwhelmingly the Somali community that was hit by COVID with, uh, I think, at least six people dying within a, within a few days. And she responded to this by writing an article that basically said that they only had themselves to blame, right? Because they don't engage with Swedish society, they're not integrated. Um, and so, and, and they don't trust Swedish doctors. So I wonder why. <laughs> so, so placing the burden on the Somali community uh, rather than on the fact that they act as unequal and frequently deeply racist healthcare, right? There's the segregation, the way that you live, the fact that you can't take time off work and work from home if you're working class. Mm -hmm. um, so all those things uh, were reduced to cultural differences. And then a month later, when George Floyd was brutally murdered, she comes out in support of Black Lives Matter. And it's, you could, you could claim that it's cynicism and absolutely it is cynicism but it's also i think the way that power operates it's the way you can say this is bad but this is not that bad that is not it um right so so and harking back to our previous conversation as well the way in which um inclusion and representation is weaponized against the communities it it pretends to protect. So uh, saying, for instance, oh, well, uh, now uh, Liberalna, the Liberal That's Party, the they have a black um, leader, Miamko Sabuni. And so the fact that she chooses to work with the Sweden Democrats can't be racist. <laughs> so, so I think, and I think Sweden, in particular, really prides itself on inclusion and prides mm. itself on representation. Mm. And that's a real issue when you want to talk about racism as something beyond the interpersonal, something structural and something yes. deadly. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and in any ways, a kind of Nordic exceptionalism that that is depicted upon Nordic countries that, that like Phyllis said, and not Phyllis, but Judith said that, um, that this is a, these are the very sophisticated countries. These are the, the democratic countries. These are the countries of equality, um, gender equality uh, and, and paycheck equality, everything. But when, when we're really looking closer, do we really have that equality? Um, we're looking at policies that are brought after 2016, uh, the migration wave as well, like what, what happened there? We're looking at attitudes within those offices and and those caretakers institutions that are in contact daily with uh, with people with migrant backgrounds uh, and especially not every type of migrant background but especially non-white racialized people. So mm. uh, we're also like in this kind of um, it's a weird limbo where we're at because also in Finland the, the discussion about uh, blackness and and the discussion about being uh, POC uh, was like it exploded with Black Lives Matter, even though there had been already by the EU uh, a, a research that was showing that out of out of the twelve countries that were researched uh, at that uh, was it two thousand and eighteen, Finland was the most racist towards African. Uh, people with African inheritance uh, coming into this country. So, like, we have that knowledge. Like, we can't blame it on not being sophisticated. Like, we can't blame it on not knowing. And I think a lot of people then, uh, POCs who have been uh, be having those discussions also on, on mainstream media, have said it out loud that you can't now pretend that you didn't know that you don't know that that you could you could have never guessed um, the whole idea of every single interview with uh, a non-white person, starting with, "Have you experienced racism?" 
as if it was, like said, just these kind of uh, violent encounters, interpersonal encounters, and, and deleting the, the history and the, the whole uh, structure that lies behind those encounters. Mm. Why are they possible and why are they happening? Because the structures support that kind of behavior. Uh, and it's there in the structures already, but it's 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 not as vulgar or it's not as um, avert, but it's mm. still there. Uh, and it's maybe not for a white person, maybe it's not as a word, but <laughs> but it is there and it, it, it and it's um it's hard not to notice it. Like it's it's really hard not to notice it. If we're having if we're having a discussion in, in the Finnish context where we're looking at um police and we, we had a couple of years ago we had an incident of a Facebook group full of police. And it was like, what was it? Two or one third or two thirds of the policemen uh, working in Finland were part of that Facebook group. And they were openly racist. But because the Finnish police is investigated by themselves and they're mm -hmm. con uh, condemned by themselves, <laughs> there was the, no issue was found. This is this is private life. This is this is people also having other freedom of speech, right? Exactly, exactly. So so. I think that that is also one of the key elements, as Judith was saying, that there is no racism. Uh, racism comes from somewhere else, or that racism is brought by the, the migrants or with, with non-white heritage into the country. Mm. Well, mm. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. the classic, right? Which is yeah. like, you're the racist one. Exactly, exactly. The divisive, divisive. Exactly, exactly. And also the emotions that are so, because of the Nordics, the, the people also putting themselves in a really high rank above, you know, people from Balkans, people from Central Europe, you know, we, we don't smoke indoors and we don't do this and this and we're very healthy and that. And then then this kind of coming out of like, actually, you know what, you guys are the most racist that there are. In Europe, like how how could you explain that if you are the sophisticated one, and no sophistication, you know, has racism in it, and then you know it's it's a it's a it's a complete dissonance about everything. It's like, you know, how do you then explain eugenics? Like that's that's a whole form of of science. Like how mm. that's you know. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, it's like Judith said with yeah. the gaslighting. Mm. Yeah, uh, I if just I want to let Phyllis. Mm. Phyllis was trying to comment, yeah. No, yeah, sorry. No, it's, I'm like listening, taking it all in. And I, I it's just, everything resonates. Um, I, I just want to speak quickly to the Danish perspective as I see it, um, because I see that there is quite a difference between especially Denmark and Sweden. And we tend to, on, I think on both sides of the pond, pride ourselves in being each other's opposites. Um, <laughs> however silly that is um but but so i i left denmark a long time ago i left denmark back in 2005 and then i've been in and out since um and i'm you know i must acknowledge that one of the reasons why i keep leaving is because a sensation of suffocation um very special type of gaslighting and othering that I experience when I am in Denmark, mainly probably because it is my home. It is where I'm born, where I'm raised, where half of my genetics are from, yet I don't experience being included as 100% a member of society. Um, I feel more othered in Denmark than anywhere else in the world that I have lived. Um, and I think that there's a special case. I see it in all over the Nordics, but I feel like Denmark started a bit sooner than the rest with the very advert um, racist policies um, and the rhetorics that we allow uh, our politicians and um, media to have um and i've thought 
long and hard about how come it is like this because again as mo most of you have mentioned already we tend to have a public discourse on racism as something that happens in the u.s um that it's very rare that like that it really happens in scandinavia because we understand racism as uh the kkk or <laughs> lynch lynching uh, pretty uh police brutality and um and neo-Nazis. We have all of that in Scandinavia too, but, um, but we don't see it as often as it's given to us by um, media from across the pond. But what I will say is that I think that Denmark being 5 million people, um, we have, in my opinion, we, we have a tendency to romanticize our past um, and and also in that kind of being the little guy always, so that we had nothing to do with being occupied by Germany. We have nothing to do with, uh, I mean, we can't help but enter war with the US and <laughs> because how can we stand alone? You know, all these discourses on how we're such a tiny nation, but in that also comes a lot of pride of old days, of Vikings, of being big, yet we tend to always leave out our, our wealth building due to colonialism, due to uh, the human trafficking of people from West Africa to the West Indies. Um, we deliberately try not to talk about Greenland. Um, and so, but so we still consider Denmark to be this very homogenous, white, uh, tiny country that's just really good and really great for everyone. But mm. yet we are completely terrified of anyone from the outside taking over. There's this discourse on if we have too many non-Danes, then we will lose Danish values. And mm. I've heard for 20 years now, politicians trying to define what is Danish values. And the only way they've been able to do that is by excluding things. Because mm -hmm. there is no set thing that is particularly Danish. But the way we can understand ourselves is like, in the opposition to the other. So then all of a sudden, eating pork became Danish. Celebrating Christmas became Danish. But yet again, an example I like to use is my mother. My mother is a white Danish person who doesn't celebrate Christmas and doesn't eat pork. But she will never be questioned in her Danishness. Because again, it's gaslighting. We know exactly who we're talking about when we talk mm -hmm. about pork or when mm -hmm. we talk about Christmas. And we yes. can do that in a way where we don't have to say, well, it's because we don't like Muslims or mm. we don't like black people. Um, mm. But then again, what I see is that in Denmark now, these things are being said outright. There is not even the, the overt uh, <laughs> racism level anymore. I feel like it's become so, we have become so desensitized to the the rhetorics that is being used on people who actually live in Denmark. And mm. in that, in rhetoric, I think there's something that I've also come across abroad that I really hope that we can start integrating in Scandinavia and the Nordics is the rhetorics on inclusion. So why is it that we keep talking about second generation immigrants, mm -hmm. third generation immigrants, descendants of immigrants, when had it been, let's say in the US or Canada or other places, it would have been first generation American. Why is it that we're excluding, we keep, ex so if you're, if you're third generation, that means your grandparents came to this country. Both your parents were born in Denmark, but you will be considered a third generation foreigner. 
Yes, I, I think that also resonates to the Norwegian uh, context. I, I think very much about this work that was made in the, the Dutch context, but uh, called the white innocence. But I think it is very much applicable as well in the Nordics and, and the Nordics specifically as kind of paradigm of whiteness. And therefore, it's also a paradigm of goodness, justice, and all good values, you know, we have uh, we have even abolished classes. We don't have classes. We have like um, working uh, workers unions that are super powerful and negotiate good conditions for all workers. And then when people even talk about the working class, who's the working class now, right? We know who are actually driving the buses and taking care of the elders, you know, washing spaces and still when it's talked about working class it's not us we're talking about um so um i think very much about this white innocence about this denial that is so nordic it's uh, it's for everything and it's an intersection of denials yeah and just to, add to just that? folks listening i just want to mention that that is a reference to the book white innocence by gloria wecker so definitely uh check that out uh, yes Judith, exactly. go ahead. yeah adding to that to white innocence i also think a lot about white victimhood as being very central to the way that uh, nordic racism operates today um I know Johannes Anjuder, who's like a, a Swedish writer, wrote an essay about kind of the far right and the way that they weaponized victimhood, essentially being like, uh, you know, we're just living our lives and then these people sweep in with their violent cultures and their uh, rape culture and their kind of um, looting and burning, like that kind of thing, where you position yourself as as being fundamentally a peaceful culture, a kindly culture, a gentle culture, as being somehow weaker than the people who come here uh, for whatever reason, because of war, in the, because of poverty, because of climate change, right? And so you position yourself as the victim. And in that case, anything that you do is self-defense. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, so, um, so deeply ingrained in the way fascism operates. And it's something that is a... I think a natural progression to what we've seen these past years, where uh, people of color, uh, people who are racialized as non-white are always the aggressors and white people are always the victims. Uh, and that's also a way of maintaining innocence, the kind of way of saying, why are you doing this to me? But at the same time, we're the ones who are accused of behaving like victims. So, the, so being like, oh, stop feeling sorry for yourself because you're not white. Oh, stop blaming us for everything. Take some responsibility. Oh, you're not a victim. All of that stuff is directed at us. But the ones who are actually using it politically, uh, weaponizing it in political discourse are right-wing people and primarily people who come from the far right, but it's spread to the level, I think, that it's a common, I think it's a, a common way of, thinking about Swedish identity, white Swedish identity now. I think a lot of people are, are deeply influenced by that. The the sort of um, the feeling of being under siege or under attack um, mm -hmm. by other other forces. Um, so I find yeah I find I that think that's those a great really way of putting it. And they go hand in hand, right? And I think what, what all of you have really pointed at and I think it comes out in, in all of your respective works as well. Uh, and even when it's not, I'm thinking about Monica, you know, you, you've done stuff around sort of tracing African history and Judith, you've done work around tracing Swedish uh, colonial history and, and impact of the, the, their participation in slavery. And of course, both David and, and Phyllis, you work on questions that have to do with sort of ancestral heritage and thinking about diaspora and connections you know, this erasure of history, right, the, the construction of innocence, right, relies on this complete erasure of Nordic uh, engagement in colonialism and transatlantic slavery and intra-American slavery for that matter as well, which I think is not only important in terms of the sort of seeing how deliberately this facade is built, but of course, you know, when we're talking about blackness in particular, the notion that 
Nordic uh, understandings, representations, attitudes about blackness would not be shaped by this. It is ridiculous, right? When you've literally had policy of of enslavement uh, and and slave trading, you built your economies on this, right? And then the other part that you all have spoken to that I think is also really important is how language comes into this both through the sort of, again, the manipulation of language, what, what language is acceptable, what language is seen as native, right? Even, I think this is something that's used to sort of um, gaslight and, and de-weaponize, I think, criticism and black perspectives is the idea that we're the ones importing language or perspectives that are not relevant for the Nordics, right? Because it's not, it's not a Swedish word, it's not a Danish word, it's not a Finnish word, but that's also because they've, so deliberately try to ensure that this language cannot be used and that is being framed as racist. Uh, so really thinking about the relationship between language there, I think is really important in particular for cultural work, right? Where this is what we're, we're talking about. Um, there's so much more I want to ask you all, but I, I want to be mindful of, of your time. Uh, and so I'd like to end with a question about, you know, where you think we go from here. I mean, one thing for sure that has come up is the question of, you know, our relationship to institutions, art institutions, to the state, whatever. Um, but I'm also really curious about your thinking in terms of the future of imagining new possibilities of creating our own institutions, our own collectivities, our own relationships. What are the possible? What are the possibilities? And do you see a future for sort of Afro-Nordic um, organizing yeah. and community building around this this work in solidarity. Absolutely. I definitely I think want to. Yeah. Go ahead, Phyllis. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think that um, so the community building is a really important aspect, and I think across the Nordics is very important because we do have. Um, a lot in common, yet slight differences. And um, I just want to really quickly point out this book. Um, it's called Actualize Utopia, um, and it is brilliant work. Somehow, the Danish institutions I have talked to doesn't even know it exists. Don't know it, it exists, which is ridiculous because this was a Nordic. Um, <laughs> project over three years of understanding the lack of uh, diversity and inclusion in the Nordic art field um, that ended with a conference in December 19 in Oslo. And a lot of what has been pointed out today has been discussed, yet we're still discussing it. Um, but I, what, I, what I took from being a part of, of those projects um, was the the need to to interact with community across the Nordics, and so I, I I'm still in development because pandemic, and you know you gotta rest too. We can't always be working hard, hard, hard. I need to also just exist. But Third Culture Kid Collective is my little baby um, that hopefully will blossom soon, but that is meant to be a platform for um, what I like to consider third culture kids, people growing up with uh, a culture at home and a culture in society, us who are the cultural chameleons, the navigators between spaces um, in arts and academia, so that we can come together because I think we need, there's powers in numbers and, and we really need to stop accepting tokenism, you know? Um, I don't think that any anyone is doing it on purpose. I think it's what Monica said earlier, that we're so used to only having one or two spots. And so we, you know, we, we have tunnel vision, um, where I think in order for real change to happen, we really need to um, understand that maybe our personal careers won't blossom in this fight, but uh, that maybe collectively we can create radical change for the next generation. Because one of the things that really upsets me the most 
and that's with all areas of, of racism, not just in arts, but also just existing in the Nordics, is to find out that the generation before me endured the same as I did growing up. And the generation that's young now, that's in school now, are still going through the same things. And so I, I really hope that we can come together and be the change that we need to see in order for the next generation to not have to go through all of these like levels of, of glass ceilings and closed doors and othering and gaslighting. Yeah, I think that um, definitely was Phil said, and I, I have to say that I'm like very thankful for for the Sami and for the Roma and for all of those, um, all of those uh, communities that have worked already before us for us to be able to work further because they the 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 foundings are there by them, and I I think that. I, I when I'm thinking about <laughs> when I'm thinking about the Finnish context, I'm thinking that oh, we have already we've established new medias that are not not run by white whiteness or or white institutions, uh, and I, I dream that um, this kind of black solidarity uh, that is still on its like baby steps would just like you know, grow and, and, and blossom and, and take us further. Because I think that it, like in general in Nordics, like we need to, we need to come together and we need to find ways of, of working together um, to strengthen each other. Not, not, not as in like state wise, but as individuals, as, as groups, as, as communities. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think that I dream of, as Phyllis said, like, I don't know if it's the next generation or the generation after that that's going to be in, in some way a lot further from here. But I dream that this ends at some point, that, that this work that we're doing, it's beautiful, but I hope that it's unnecessary uh, in the future. I hope that those dreams, whatever I had as a dream before that wall that, you know, has has just blocked my way towards that it, it, it's not there for the generations in the future that there is only walls that support but not walls that you know segregate walls that keep you from where you're going so but i think that the next step definitely is to uh connect deeper with with the nordic uh with the nordic black uh communities mm. I uh, really, yeah, I really agree with that. And I really love that what you said about how any struggle <clears throat> for liberation has to be a struggle for the abolition <laughs> of, of that struggle. Like, we are essentially working to make ourselves unnecessary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that is such an important thing to have as a focus and also as a vision like a uh, hundred years from now, this work will not be necessary. Um, and, and it's the same thing with any liberatory movement, it's the, the black movement, the feminist movement, the socialist movement, essentially trying to create a world in which these, these methods of, of resistance are unnecessary because there's nothing to resist anymore. We've created what we, what we want. Um, We've made space for each other, finally. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Love that. Yes, I think uh, the most most of what I think has already been said. Um, I will allow myself to do a little bit of uh, of uh, advertising for my work. That um, uh, I have a text in the actualized Utopia book that Phyllis just showed. And it is uh, also available online, uh, so uh, it's for free and you can read at any time. And um, I also think that this conference was a seed and that we still, uh, we are, I think we, I feel like we are interrupted now. 
and a lot of things that are happening at the same time are showing us different ways of being together that we will uh, carry further. And um, so um, I, I do believe that we um, that we have a lot of opportunities to uh, connect across uh, the Nordic borders and uh, enrich each other's works and also connect to other uh, groups that are marginalized as well and make and create this entire intersectional uh, consciousness. And yes, um, and not lose of sight that uh, Yes, what are we going to do when we have saved the world so we can still think of enjoying ourselves and and rest and have pleasure because this is also uh, resisting and also being revolutionary like thriving is something that has been de denied to us and um, I think we should uh, focus on that as well bringing joy to our lives and to each other's lives being compassionate I think these are great things that we can we can share, and um, and I am here. If any of you want to engage in further conversation, I will be more than happy. Same. I love that. I agree with everything that you have said, and in particular, love the idea that you know we're trying to make ourselves obsolete, or at least make these particular struggles, these particular methods obsolete. Uh, things we can do after that. <laughs> Imagine having the time, the energy to put on so many other things. Uh, but I, I really also truly love and believe in this process and the community building and the engagement. And I'm so thankful to all of you for being here today and engaging uh, together. And I hope that we can have many more of these, these engagements in the future. And, you know, my mentor, uh, George Lipsitz always says everything that inhibits also enables. So I hope that this is sort of one of the things that the pandemic has perhaps showed us is that there are ways for us to engage across borders, uh, across disciplines, across fields uh, to create sort of new collectivities and, and new solidarities. So I really hope for that in the future and for many more conversations like these. So really want to thank all the wonderful panelists. Thank you, Phyllis. Judith, Monica, Deze, for joining us tonight. I want to thank Nordic Culture Contact, Nordic Cultural Point, for sponsoring and organizing this and for allowing us to have this platform. Uh, I want to thank Astra for uh, similarly creating space for us and for joining us and wanting to do this work. And thanks to everyone who joined us here tonight. And make sure that you keep an eye on these amazing uh, artists, scholars, uh, coming up in the future. They'll be getting into what uh, you can say is good trouble that will change <laughs> change the field and face the world. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank Edwin. you. It's been wonderful talking to you all. Yeah, the same. Bye.